All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Social Emotional Milestones in Early Childhood Development with Naomi Brinney. So Naomi has worked in early intervention for the past nine years and has 20 years of experience working with children, youth, and adults in both private and community organizations. She is an infant mental health specialist and uniquely trained to support parent and child relationships and address challenges in social emotional development. Naomi also holds an infant and early childhood mental health con consultation certification and has partnered with school programs, daycares, and community-based agencies to support teachers and caregivers in building children's social emotional skills. In her current role with Infant and Toddler Connection, Naomi supervises clinical staff members, serves as an infant mental health liaison with community agencies and providers, and develops and implements training and uses her expertise to support competency of early interventionists. Naomi has an extensive background in reflective practice, clinical supervision, trauma-informed principles, temperament, relationship-based interventions, and attachment. Prior to working in, um, uh, in this setting, Naomi was a community-based mental health crisis response survivor, su supervisor, excuse me, a clinical social worker in a psychiatric hospital, and a behavioral interventionist as a residential treatment center. Naomi is passionate about supporting the social emotional development of children and building family capacity. As the parent of a child who received early intervention services, Naomi brings a shared experience to her role in providing tools and resources to empower parents in, su in supporting their child's development. Well, welcome, Naomi, and thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. I'm, I'm so excited to be here today and I'm really excited to get to talk to all of you and share some information about social emotional milestones and also um, talked about, talk about what that looks like in early intervention. So the first thing we're gonna kind of just go through really quickly is talking about our learning objectives. So I always like to have this at the beginning of the presentation because this is gonna kind of guide the things that we're talking about today. Um, so we're really gonna be looking at um, the kind of core concepts of social emotional development in young children. We're also gonna um, explore the role of parents and caregivers in attachment and early learning. Um, we're gonna talk about how um, we can develop some skills for responding to social emotional challenges. We're gonna have some opportunities um, for reflection. And um, we're also gonna understand and um, develop some new ways of approaching children's needs. So those are some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and I wanted to first start by um, kind of thinking about this question. You know, when we talk about social emotional development, and some of you might have heard that word before, we also talk about social emotional learning. The reason why social emotional development is so important and why it's something that I'm so passionate about sharing with other people is that it encompasses a range of skills. So it, um, you know, when we think about attention, play, self-regulation, developing friendships, all of those are social emotional skills. And those are important in early childhood. And they're also important across the lifespan. So if you think about yourself as an adult and the skills that you might need, for example, when you are driving in traffic, right? If you are on 495 and perhaps there's a traffic accident and you are late to where you need to go. You're using some of those self-regulation skills that you have as an adult to be able to manage that situation. And so for our kids, you know, when we have young children and when we have babies and young children, we think about, you know, oh, walking and talking and moving. And we don't always think about some of those social emotional skills. And so social, social emotional development is so important because as a parent, it also helps us to understand our child's behavior. When we know what's happening with their social emotional development, we can understand their behavior. We're better able to meet their needs and we have more appropriate responses to what is happening. So we're gonna start with defining social emotional development. And they, these are kind of these building blocks. So social emotional development is the process that kids go through to acquire the knowledge and skills and then to be able to apply 
what they know to understand and manage their emotions, to explore and learn, to feel and show empathy for others, and to establish and maintain positive relationships. Babies are born wired to connect with other people. They're in tune with their parents' voices, the environmental sounds of their home. They become aware of and are learning the language that's spoken in their home. And so as we think about some of these different building blocks, we need to know what they look like throughout development. So when a child is very young, when they're crying and their caregiver responds to that cry, that's building a social emotional connection. When kids are able to identify their feeling words. So when they're really small, feeling words can look like stop, no, mine. As they get older, some of their feeling words might look like I'm angry, I'm sad right? We think about establishing and maintaining those positive relationships with their family members, right? That's where it starts with babies. They have that relationship with their family, and then those relationships expand and build over time. And so we're also thinking about all of these skills that are established um, with an understanding of the family's culture and also the community that that family is a part of. We also want for kids to be able to have predictable interactions. So when kids, sometimes we talk about consistency and how important that is for kids. But when we have those predictable interactions, we know what we can expect. And so when we know what to expect, that builds a sense of safety. And that's really important for kids. Um, it also helps them to modulate their emotional and social responses. And that means that they're able to, to know what they need to do in different environments. And we also want for kids really, you know, at their core to have the sense of trust where they can build those secure relationships with other people. We also want them to have self-awareness so they know the environments that they're a part of. They can experience those environments. They can express their emotions. And they also are developing autonomy, which means that they are able to explore and learn within their daily activities. They're getting more independent. Um, they're learning about their routines. And so all of these are really, really key concepts in early social emotional development. Emotional co-regulation. This is one of the most important things to understand about, especially infants and young children, but really all children and all people. Um, so when we talk about emotional co-regulation, this is something that is initiated and maintained by the caregiver or the parent. And the reason that it is initiated and maintained by the caregiver is because the child on their own does not have the skills to regulate themselves. When they're very small, they learn those skills over time, um, but they need someone else to be able to model those skills for them. No one in the history of human beings on the planet has ever calmed down because someone has told them to do it. They have calmed down because they've learned the skills that they need to be able to calm. And so it's really important as a parent to be able to kind of calm your own self so that you're able to provide that calming presence for your child. And that's a very hard thing to do as a parent. I have four young children. I know that can be very challenging to do. Um, but what you're doing is you're kind of modeling for them, right? I can be a calm presence and that allows for your child to also be able to calm. Now, sometimes what happens is as parents, we can become overwhelmed by our child's emotions. Um, and sometimes what that looks like is that we'll attempt to kind of stop that emotion from occurring, right? So you might see that there's a baby that's crying and the parent's like, shh, 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 you know, no crying. Or you have a toddler that's having a moment and it's shh, 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 no crying, right? And the challenge with that is that when we kind of inhibit our kids from expressing their emotions, they don't learn how to work through them, right? And that's a really important skill. We need for kids to express those emotions, even though it might be uncomfortable for us because they need to learn, I can do it even though this is uncomfortable, even though I don't like how I'm feeling, I do have the ability to work through and manage these emotions. And I might need support from other people. And I might need to take some space. And I might need to cry it out for a little bit, right? When I'm a toddler, I might just need to 
to yell and scream or stop my feet. Um, but as parents, if we can um, kind of allow for those emotions to be experienced, kids then learn what it is that they need in order to help them to feel regulated. You know, when kids are first born, when they're first kind of in the world, it's really imbalanced. It's kind of like this, right? The parents are putting forth all of this effort and the kids are not really, they don't have those same skills that we have as adults. Over time, those interactions become more balanced. Kids learn coping skills. They develop self-regulation. And so it becomes easier. That effort that we're putting forth as parents becomes more balanced over time. The consistent response that we give our kids as parents lets our kids know emotional distress is manageable. It's okay that we have our feelings. And it's okay that sometimes we have a more difficult time, right? Everything is not going to be easy and wonderful all the time. Sometimes things are going to be challenging. And we don't attempt to remove those experiences. We help to give our kids the skills to be able to navigate through those experiences. So the other thing that emotional co-regulation helps to do is it helps kids learn to recognize label and understand feelings in themselves and others. And so as parents, we kind of model for our children how to express their feelings in ways that are appropriate, right? So for example, it is okay that you're upset and you're crying. We don't hit our brother when we're upset, right? And so we're giving them those things that they can do when they're feeling upset or frustrated or overwhelmed. Babies from birth, they learn who they are by how they're treated. They cannot regulate on their own. And so that's why they rely so heavily on their parents and caregivers. Sometimes what happens as parents is that we attach negative meaning to emotions that are typical for our children to express. So I hear parents sometimes that will tell me, you know, my two-year-old is really manipulative. Two-year-olds don't have the cognitive skills to manipulate. So that's not a correct statement. Um, what's happening in that moment is that kids have learned cause and effect, right? And so they're not manipulating. They're attempting to get their needs met with the tools that they know how to use. Um, and so as parents, you know, when we don't understand what, what is happening with our child's behavior, we might respond in ways that are not supportive of their development. Um, or, you know, it can be frustrating for us because we're thinking that our child is behaving in a particular way on purpose when really, you know, the way that they're behaving is because they have that need that is not being met. So it's really important to have the capacity to identify, understand, and express emotions in a healthy way. Even as adults, that's a really those are really important skills to be able to have. Um, toddlers too, you know, when we think about kind of babies transitioning into toddlerhood, they're aware that they are kind of their own person. They can have different thoughts and feelings from someone else. Toddlers also, for anyone who's ever parented or or supported a toddler they want to control some things, right? And we all want to be able to have control in our lives. And so sometimes when toddlers want to be in control, we look at that and we're like, oh, they want to control everything. Toddlers still don't have a lot that they can control. So they're attempting to exert that control where they can. Um, and that's important for kids to learn. What is it that they can be in control of? What is it that they can't? And when a kiddo begins to escalate, the, the reactions that we have as parents can sometimes intensify that power struggle. And so, you know, for us to be able to manage our feelings helps for kids to be able to feel safe. The other thing that's really important to understand is that everybody has a sensory system. And so the, your sensory system is kind of the way that your body interacts with the world, right? And so there may be things that you, even as an adult, right, you might be more sensitive to noise or to light or to you know, an unexpected sound. And your child also has their own sensory system. And so it may be that you know, they might be feeling hungry or tired or you know, emotionally kind of or sensory, they're really stimulated. And so thinking about the impact of that sensory system and, and how that's affecting the way a child is behaving. Um, 
And again, that's something that even us as adults, we have our sensory system. We've also learned some ways, right? We know when it's cold outside, we put a jacket on. We know when maybe, you know, we have a headache, we go and lay down in a dark room. Our kids are still working on developing those skills. So some of the things that can impact social emotional development from occurring, right? When you might be a part of a family or might be working with a family and there's multiple stressors that a family is facing, there might be some strain in that parent-child relationship. There might be some disrupted attachment patterns. We've got kiddos who have experienced trauma. We've got kiddos, um, this is something that we see often in our program in early intervention, you know, kiddos that have um, really significant medical needs and might also have some cognitive delays or some cognitive impacts. Um, and so we think about some of those ways that um, social emotional development may not occur in the way that we would expect. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about temperament. Um, and temperament is something that's very important to understand because again, you know, we, we often talk about our children's temperament. We also as adults have our own temperament style. So the way that temperament is defined, it's a kind of the collection of characteristics that makes each of us unique. It shapes the way we experience the world, how we interact with other people, and it's biologically based. It's kind of your unique wiring. So it's not something that you kind of control. It's not something that you, that's good or bad or positive or negative. It just is who you are and the way that you interact with other people. So being able to kind of know and understand your child's temperament or the temperament of the children you're working with helps kind of demonstrate for them that feelings are recognized and they're important. Kids need help with labeling their feelings and learning strategies for managing uncomfortable emotions. Feelings can be overwhelming. They can be overwhelming for us as adults. And it, they can also be really overwhelming for children. And so, you know, I talk about it often like you're riding an emotional roller coaster. So you've got all these emotions that you're experiencing. You don't really have a name for them. And you don't really know when that feeling might change or when it might feel different. Um, and so it helps when we can at, kind of identify the names for feelings, because that helps our kids to communicate that everybody has feelings. They're normal. They're to be expected. Big emotions are not problematic. The way that they're managed can be problematic. And so we want to think about, you know, how are we understanding our child's temperament and how are we giving them tools so that they are able to navigate their relationships, their environment, their interactions with other people. So there are three different temperament types and um, 65, about 65% 65 of all children fit into kind of one of these three, the orange, the green and the blue parts of this pie. So about 40% of kids are in that green, um, sorry, that orange, area where they're easy or flexible. 10% are in that active and feisty category. 15% are, you know, slow to warm up or cautious. And then you've got 35% of kids that are a combination. Um, so, you know, think about yourself too. You might fall into one of these different temperament types. When we think about kiddos um, with that easier, flexible temperament style, we're thinking about kids that kind of are, are more calm. They've got regular sleeping and eating habits. They're adaptable to different environments. Um, because, you know, sometimes with easier, flexible kiddos, we think, oh, you know, they just, you know, go with the flow. But sometimes it's also important to think about, you know, when you've got someone who's very flexible, sometimes it's important to be rigid, right? When, when maybe someone is pushing your boundaries, when maybe something is someone is doing something that you don't like, it's important to kind of make sure that you are able to speak up when you need to. So that's something that we help kids to be able to do. Those active or feisty kiddos, you know, they might be cautious of new people in situations. They might be upset by, you know, loud noises or a lot of activity. They might have some stronger reactions or responses. And so, you know, those might be the kiddos that we use um, lots of activities. So we might use, you know, running on the playground, or we might give them a way to kind of release that 
that pent up frustration or energy. Um, and we also might give them, you know, a way to um, kind of express their feelings as well. Those kiddos that might be more cautious or slow to warm up, you know, they might need to kind of sit in a room for a little bit before they want to get down and play. Um, they might prefer kind of those activities like sitting and doing a puzzle or coloring. Um, and so we want for those kiddos, you know, they might really benefit from having a routine in place um, and, you know, giving them a lot of time to kind of warm up, establish those relationships, feel comfortable in different environments. So again, thinking about your own temperament, right? Each of us has a temperament that is kind of unique to us. Um, and so it, it can be important. Maybe that's not ever something that you thought about, but it can be important to reflect on, you know, what's my temperament style? How do I kind of best interact? What are the things that I need during my day to kind of feel like, you know, my day is successful. I'm able to navigate all of these different things that are happening. Sometimes what happens is that there's a mismatch in temperament. So maybe you as a parent are a really easygoing parent, and maybe you've got a kiddo that is real active or feisty. Um, and that can be tough because those, you know, the way that you kind of experience the world might be really different than the way that your child experiences the world. Um, and so that can lead to some challenges in the relationship. As a parent, we may not understand what our child needs to be successful or meet their developmental milestones. It might cause conflict because we might approach a, be a behavior or a problem differently. That doesn't mean that it's you know, completely problematic because there can be that understanding that is developed. It just takes us as the parent or the caregiver to be able to recognize, hey, we've got this mismatch. You know, the way that my, what my child needs or the way that they're experiencing this might just look different than the way that I'm experiencing. So we talked about our temperament types, and now we're gonna kind of talk about some of those characteristics that describe an individual's temperament. So when we think about emotional intensity, we've got some low reactors and we've got some big reactors. So low reactors might be kiddos that seem less demanding. They might be kind of quieter, maybe they sleep you know, longer or, you know, are more consistent with their sleep. They might tolerate a lot of stimulation. Um, but just because they're kind of seen sometimes as less demanding doesn't mean that they require less effort. Um, you might actually, in fact, have to work harder to kind of hold their attention. On the other end of that kind of intensity spectrum, we have those big reactors. Those big reactors express their feelings in big ways. They might yell or shout. They might throw something to get your attention. They might react to, you know, physical stimulation. Maybe they don't like, you know, a tag on their t-shirt. Maybe they don't want to wear particular clothing because it's uncomfortable for them. So for a lot of kiddos, intensity isn't, you know, they're, they don't kind of exist on that intense end of the spectrum, they kind of fall somewhere between. But some situations, they might be a bigger reactor. And in some situations, they might be a lower reactor. Um, so it's really important to kind of think about, you know, for something that maybe wouldn't bother you as a parent, or it wouldn't be a big deal for you, but your child is having a big reaction. Think about that emotional intensity. Where are they at? What's going on? What are they responding to? Um, how might that look different than the way that you're managing or handling a situation? We also think about those kiddos with their activity level. We've got some kiddos that are sitters and we've got some kiddos that are movers and shakers. Some kids are just not action oriented. They tend to, you know, be happy to kind of sit and play. They take in the world by looking and listening. They can focus their attention maybe for some longer periods of time. They, you know, want to figure out that puzzle piece and how it gets into the puzzle. Other kids are movers and shakers. They want to roll. They want to move. They want to squirm. They want to grab and, you know, um, touch and explore everything. They, you know, these movers and shakers, they like to have lots of space to move. They like to all, they often are, the, you know, can be some daredevil kiddos where they might need some more supervision um, because they, you know, want to do backflips on the couch. Um, and, and either of these activity levels, again, is not problematic. It's just thinking about the way that your child prefers to interact because then you can 
plan activities and you can plan interactions that best meet their need for activity. Um, again, a lot of kids are not at one end or the other, they kind of fall somewhere in the middle. So sometimes they might really like to be moving around and sometimes they might wanna sit and do something that's a little bit more quiet. Then we think about frustration tolerance. Um, some kids are easily frustrated and some kids are, you know, can be more persistent. And so, you know, persistent means that they're not giving up when they're faced with a challenge. So you're looking at our little friend here who's putting on her sock and she is, you know, determined to get that sock on her foot. Um, and so she might try some different ways. You know, maybe she puts the sock on backwards the first time, but she's kind of sitting and, and sticking with it. Um, Kiddos that get easily frustrated, they might, you know, when that puzzle piece doesn't fit in quite the way they want it to, they might get really upset and throw the puzzle piece, right? Or they might throw the whole puzzle um, because they can get upset more quickly when something doesn't go the way that they plan. And, you know, especially in toddlerhood, a lot of things don't go the way you plan. Um, and that can be really challenging when you're a toddler and you just want that puzzle piece to fit where you think it should. Um, and that, that's tough, right? To, to kind of accept, well, maybe it won't fit that way or we might need to turn the puzzle piece. Um, so it's, you know, thinking about those ways that we can give the support to the child with what they need. Maybe with a kiddo who's persistent, they don't want us to help them, but maybe we just sit next to them on the bed so that we're there, you know, if they do need our help. For kiddos that might be more easily frustrated, you know, we might offer to help them with the puzzle piece or maybe we find a different activity you know, when they're starting to get upset or frustrated, we find a different activity and we kind of change what we're doing um, to an activity that they might be more successful with um, so that they can, you know, have that opportunity to be successful. And then they might be more willing to try that puzzle again. When we think about reaction to people, we've got those kiddos that are a little bit more slow to warm up and we've got those glad to meet you kiddos. So some kiddos are just more hesitant around people they don't know. And, you know, sometimes as adults, we forget that we, you know, even with our family members or, you know, friends of ours, we've had a lot more opportunities to develop social skills than our kids have, right? And so the way that I might go into a room and I want to say hi to everybody, that may not be the way that my kiddo reacts. And so if I'm going in and I'm like, oh, well, this is someone I know super well, and my child has seen them only once, of course, I'm going to have a different reaction. Of course, I'm going to jump right into conversation. My child might need a minute to kind of, who are you? It's been a while since I've seen you, right? And they might just be a little bit more kind of slow to warm up. They might need some time to kind of play on their own. Maybe they just want to play with one familiar friend or adult. Um, and they're they're content with being, you know, kind of more quiet. It's not problematic for them. Those glad to meet you kiddos, you know, they tend to engage newcomers by smiling or cooing or looking at them. Um, they kind of project this sense of like, I'm open to playing. Um, and again, sometimes kids fall somewhere in the middle, you know, when, when they see people that are familiar for them, or they see people that they've known, they're really excited. And when they see new people, they tend to be a little bit more cautious. Um, and both of those are perfectly acceptable ways of interacting with other people. Um, sometimes our expectations as parents is that our kids are going to be super social with everybody. Um, and so when they're not, we can think, oh, but they're not social. They don't want to interact with anybody. But if we give them the right environment, we find that they really do enjoy interacting with people. It's just thinking about the way that that works best for them. And then we've got reaction to change. So some kiddos kind of change happens, they take it in stride. And some kiddos like things to be the same every time. So some kids just find change harder. You know, um, young kids typically are pretty inflexible. Um, they like to kind of know what's happening in their day. They like to know what they can expect. And even for us as adults, right? You may wake up in the morning and you're thinking about your day. What's going to happen? Something happens that you weren't expecting. It's like, oh, well, now I have to take time to do that, right? And I didn't anticipate that I was going to need to do that today. 
Um, so it can be a little bit challenging when that change in routine or activity happens. Other kiddos, you know, they kind of can handle, oh, we took, you know, we drove a different way home today, or, you know, we're going to a friend's house for dinner instead of eating dinner at home. Um, both of those, you know, again, are not kind of good or bad or positive and negative. It's just knowing what works best for my child and how do I help to support them when those changes are happening. So these are a couple of um, kind of temperament quizzes that are available for free. They're online. Um, and one is for infants and one is for toddlers. Um, and it just kind of gives you some more information about, you know, what's your child's temperament like? How might that present itself in some different situations? So there's one here from um, the Mishy Sleep Academy. And then there's also one um, from the Center for Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation. Um, and this um, is the infant toddler temperament tool. Again, it's a free tool. It's available online. Um, and this also allows for you to, um, as a parent or caregiver or early childhood professional, to be able to um, look at your own temperament. And so if you're kind of wondering, you know, I'd like some more information about, you know, what temperament is, these are two really great kind of tools and resources to be able to use. Um, anybody can use them. They're free to use. Um, and you can access them as many times as you want to. So now we're going to move into talking about attachment. So um, thinking about this question, attachment automatically occurs when a baby meets new people. True or false? Okay, if you said false, you are correct. Attachment is something that develops as a result of multiple interactions that occur over time between a baby or young child and another person. So if you have a baby that's never met somebody else and you walk into a room, they're probably not going to be super attached to those other people. And that is okay. The development of attachment happens over a period of time. So attachment is very significant. It's a really important kind of aspect of early childhood. Um, and it matters because in order for kind of attachment to develop, kids need a really strong, consistent, predictable relationship with at least one primary caregiver. That can be a parent, that can be a teacher, that can be a grandparent or a family member or a family friend, someone who is close to that child and has that consistent relationship. And the reason why kids need that is because their kind of success in their social, emotional, developmental skills, and in particular, learning how to regulate their feelings is developed in the presence of that sensitive, responsive caregiver, because the child uses that relationship as a safe place from which they can then go and explore and experience the world. A child who's securely attached to their parent or caregiver will be able to explore freely. They'll engage with other people. They will be upset when their caregiver departs, as we would expect, because they like their caregiver. Um, and they're kind of able to be happy when their caregiver returns. So attachment is really influenced by the way that, the, that caregivers are responsive to and sensitive to the needs of a child. Um, parents who consistently respond to their child's needs create securely attached children. Now, attachment can be impacted by things like, you know, birth trauma, medical challenges that might require some more intrusive interventions, um, challenges with, you know, development and kind of cognitive impacts, um, stress that parents are experiencing, that temperament mismatch between parents and caregivers. Um, but the great thing about attachment is you have that opportunity to repair and rebuild, right? So even if as a parent, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, when my child was born, I was going through this period that was really stressful and maybe I wasn't as responsive to them. You still have that opportunity to build that responsivity, right? Um, it also doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect as a parent. You know, none of us are going to respond to our child in the best way 100% of the time. That's just not reality. Um, but what it means is that we're aware of 
the fact that that is really important and we're striving to be able to do that. So when our child is crying or they're expressing a need to us, we're being responsive to that need. We're able to, um, you know, when our, when babies are really small, we might say, oh, what do you need? Oh, you're sad. Oh, let me hold you, right? Even those types of things, holding our child, talking to them, those are all things that build attachment in early development. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these different attachment types. Um, so attachment um, is a kind of the theory of attachment is a psychological model that attempts to describe the dynamics of kind of long term relationships between humans. So um, it depends on a person's ability to develop basic trust with their parents or caregivers. Um, and in infants and small children, attachment is kind of a motivational aspect because it, it helps the child to seek proximity with familiar caregivers um, when they're feeling overwhelmed or kind of upset about something. Um, and we talk a lot about that secure base. So, you know, when you are maybe at a park with your child and your child might, you know, kind of walk away for a minute and then they look back at you or they come back over to you, you're their secure person. And so they're kind of exploring the world, but then they're coming back to check with you. Um, and that's really important, you know, because they're looking to you to be that model for them. Is this okay? Is this, you know, is this safe? Um, and so we want for kids to be able to develop that with their caregivers. So we think about that secure attachment, you know, kiddos that are, again, that visual or physical kind of checking in with their caregiver, they're appropriately distressed by that separation. You know, they cry when their parents leave and they're happy when their parent or caregiver comes back. Um, and they feel more comfortable interacting with strangers when a caregiver is present. Now, if you've got a kind of slow to warm kiddo, maybe that just means that they sit on your lap and they are kind of willing to look at the people around them, right? So this is kind of our goal is we want for kids to have secure attachments with us as parents, with other you know, important adults in their lives, with their peers. That's, that's a really important kind of component of development because if that is established kind of early on in a child's life, they feel more able to develop those trusting relationships with other people. You see some kiddos that have kind of a more anxious avoidance style of attachment. So they may not have that same response to separation. Um, they may kind of avoid their caregiver or parent when the parent comes back. Um, their anxiety might be kind of on the outside. It looks like they're typically developing or kind of have a, a typical response, but internally on the inside, um, they might have more anxiety. They might try and control their environment a little bit more. Um, and you might see some external kind of characteristics. So they might avoid eye contact. They may not be as in tune with, you know, directions being given. Um, they might do something kind of engage in an activity, or they might, you know, roll a car back and forth on the ground so that they can avoid that interaction. For kiddos that might have that resistant or ambivalent attachment style, these are kiddos that are distressed by separation and they're very wary of new people. Um, it's harder for them to be soothed by a parent or caregiver. Um, they might be kind of, you know, overly focused. When we, when we talk about angrily preoccupied, they might be like flipping the pages of a book really fast because they're just really upset about something or they're, they're overwhelmed, but they kind of look like they're not interested in something because they're just trying to kind of keep it together in that moment. And they might mix kind of that contact seeking with some contact resistance. And so what that looks like is they might hit or kick or squirm or, you know, want to give you a hug, but then hit you. Um, and so it's kids kind of have a harder time knowing what they need from that sensory perspective. Um, and then this other kind of last type of um, attachment style is kiddos that are disorganized. And so they don't really have a, an attachment behavior. They don't fall into one of those other kind of categories. Um, they might avoid and resist. They might have challenges with self-regulation, with controlling their emotions. Um, kiddos that can feel kind of comforted, but also um, distressed by their interactions with adults. 
And a lot of times these are kiddos that might have had, you know, a disruption in their in their early attachment. Um, and so knowing kind of again, similar to, you know, with temperament, knowing, okay, what does my child's attachment look like? helps us to understand, is there something that might be missing? Is there something that um, that isn't kind of developing in the way that we would expect so that we know how we might be able to intervene? So these are some kind of strategies for supporting healthy attachment, you know, being engaged with kids. Um, when kids are babies, we talk about this all the time in early intervention, you know, even if it's just you and you're at home with your baby kind of narrating your day, right? Which can feel a little bit ridiculous. It kind of feels like you're talking to yourself the whole day, but that's a way to build that engagement. We're going to go do laundry. Oh, I'm going to go make some dinner. You know, all of those ways that we kind of engage with our kids, having that kind of nurturing interactions with kiddos, offering those, you know, verbal and nonverbal responses. Oh, I know you're sad and you're giving them a hug. I can tell you're feeling frustrated, right? And this big kind of question here, this last bullet is asking yourself, what does the child's cues mean, right? Because sometimes when a behavior happens or when we're seeing kind of a pattern of behavior, we just think that we know why it's happening. And that may be true sometimes, but there may also be, you know, something else that's going on. So if a child, you know, if you've tried some different strategies or you've tried to um, kind of make some changes and the child doesn't seem responsive to that, um, maybe it's, you know, something to be asking yourself, what are these cues, you know, what is the meaning behind what's happening right now? Um, and then some other strategies that we have, you know, developing that trusting relationship with our kids. And, you know, we talk a lot about kind of rupture and repair because we know, you know, we're not always going to be perfect as parents. Um, and, and it's okay to kind of have those moments that are more challenging as a parent, but we're working toward that development of that trusting relationship, understanding those developmental milestones, you know, talking about, okay, what are my child's cues? What do those cues mean? Um, sharing resources with each other. Um, also reflecting on your own, you know, parenting strengths and challenges. A lot of times we come into parenting and, you know, they talk a lot about, you know, what do you do when you're pregnant? What do you do to kind of have the baby? What do you need to do? You know, you need to have the car seat and you need to have, you know, this, the sleep space for the baby. And then they kind of send you home and it can feel like, good luck. See you later. I got to raise this human now, right? So thinking about your own, you know, what do you, what are your understanding of kind of your child's development? What does that look like? Um, having those age appropriate expectations, what's typical in development? What's the impact of maybe a developmental delay or maybe, you know, a, a diagnosis that my child might have, right? A medical diagnosis. Um, thinking about, you know, our own, how we might react or respond in a particular situation. We all bring our own kind of history of relationships into parenting. And that impacts the way that we interpret and understand our child's behaviors. Um, so it can be really important for us to just kind of know ourselves and to think about, you know, what am I kind of bringing to this interaction? What might be a barrier for me? right? Um, if you're parenting with another person, you know, what might be that person's um, challenges in parenting as well? Um, parents also, as parents, we might need our own supports, right? So there might be those opportunities for us to seek out supports that we might need, whether it's a, a group of people that we can talk to, maybe it's um, you know, classes or activities in the community, maybe it's helping to support our own mental health, you know, thinking through kind of what do I need as a parent so that I can show up um, and, and be present for my child. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about challenging behaviors um, and thinking as a parent or as a caregiver or a child, early childhood professional, you know, what are some of those challenging behaviors that you've experienced or you've seen um, in other kiddos? Something that I always like to um, share and those um, individuals who work with me in early intervention, we talk about this all the time, is the ABCs of behavior. And ABCs are all behavior communicates. 
um, right? And it might be communicating a frustration or um, something that's really challenging, but behavior is a form of communication. Um, behavior happens for a reason. Behavior does not occur in a vacuum. Um, and even for adults, right? We think about um, our own behaviors, right? We may not be aware of it at that time. We behave in particular ways for particular reasons. Um, and so the same is true for our kids. So when we think about behavior, we're thinking about kind of the duration, the intensity, the frequency, right? How long is it lasting? Um, kind of what intensity? So, you know, is it um, kind of someone's physical safety is being impacted? Um, is a child, you know, throwing items, things like that? And then the frequency. So how often is that behavior happening? So um, challenging, excuse me, challenging behavior is um, behavior of kind of an intense frequent of such intensity, frequency, or duration that the physical safety of the person um, is placed in jeopardy. So it's behavior, you know, when we think about those really challenging behaviors that might impact a kiddo's ability to, you know, be around other children, or it might impact the relationships that they have with other children, or it might impact the things that you're able to do as a family, right? You might not want to be able to go in the community because you are concerned about how your child might behave. Um, and there's also different types of challenging behavior. You know, we, we think about sometimes those physical behaviors, you know, hitting or pinching or biting. Um, we also think about the yelling and the screaming. Um, and we can also think about some of those, you know, some kids engage in more destructive behaviors. You know, they throw materials or they might rip up um, objects. So behavior also has meaning. So toddlers in particular have strong feelings, lots and lots of feelings, but they don't really have appropriate tools to be able to manage those feelings. Like I talked about earlier, um, toddlers do not have the cognitive skills to manipulate. Those are skills that do not develop until closer to age five, six. So, you know, when you're thinking about a two-year-old, if as a parent, you're thinking, oh, well, they're manipulating me. That's not what is happening. And so even just reframing as a parent, okay, what is going on with my child and what do they need in this moment? Or what do they not have to be able to manage this particular situation? Um, you know, oftentimes we're telling toddlers and young children things like, use your words, right? Um, if you've ever been escalated, or upset or frustrated and someone told you to use your words, um, you might have a different response than to actually use your words, right? Because when you're upset and when you're frustrated and when you're feeling overwhelmed, it's not easy to find the appropriate words to express yourself, right? And when you've got a kiddo who's just learning about language, it's even harder for them to pull that word out, you know, to, to tell you what it is that they might need or how they might be feeling. And so, you know, we want to kind of think about what meaning are we giving to our child's behavior? Because that impacts the way that we respond to that child. Um, sometimes what happens is that we, you know, think that a child is behaving in a particular way, and then we respond kind of negatively in that situation, um, or we respond in a way that's not supportive of our child in that situation. And, you know, as adults, We've had lots and lots and lots and lots of opportunities to learn how to manage our behavior, to regulate our coping, you know, to regulate our emotions, to develop our coping skills. Toddlers and young children, they're new in the world. They're just kind of learning how to person. And so it takes a lot of repetition to be able to learn that skill. I know as a parent, sometimes I feel like, okay, we just had this conversation five minutes ago and we're going to have it again, right? And that's because kids are learning. It's still very, very new for them. Um, and a lot of behaviors that are happening are within the context of normal development. They're typical. Lots of kids bite. Lots of kids don't like it when you have to leave the playground, right? So these are not only your child in that situation, also, a lot of times as parents, we don't talk about the things that are challenging, right? We put on social media or share with other people kind of the highlight reel. And we don't talk about, oh my gosh, every time we leave the playground, my child loses it, right? 
But that happens very often with young children because it's hard to leave the playground and go ride in the car. That's not a fun thing for them to do. Kids are really egocentric. They see things from their perspective. That is a very normal developmental milestone. It's also why you can tell kids, say you're sorry. They say, sorry, and then back. Empathy doesn't develop until kiddos are closer to age four. Empathy means being able to see the other person's perspective. And so telling your kid, say sorry, they're not really owning that just yet, right? Um, and a lot of that is very, very normal and very typical in development. Sometimes as adults, we're also still working on being aware of our own feelings, right? I have to be aware of my own feelings when I drive on 495 because I don't enjoy driving on 495. And sometimes as a grown up with full access to all of my cognitive skills, I am not great when I'm in my car. And thankfully I have the windows rolled up. Sometimes I'm yelling at people. Sometimes I'm, you know, listening to music really loudly because that drowns out all of my anger. Um, and so, you know, as an adult, you know, when you're in a conflict with someone else, imagine how that feels when you don't feel like you're understood or you don't feel like someone else is listening to you or you don't feel like someone else is being responsive to your needs. It doesn't feel very good. And so even for our kids, it's not a great feeling when, you know, when the behavior is not understood and responded to in a way that's developmentally appropriate. Irrational behavior in toddlers and young children is to be expected. Um, the part of the brain that controls emotions and actions, so problem solving, impulse control, um, doesn't really start to develop until three to four. Um, and that's the start of its development. So it's not like kids have all the skills that they need at age four. Um, toddlers, you know, want to be able to have some control like we all do. Um, and so, you know, when kids kind of when we understand, okay, they're driven by their emotions. They are not logical people. If you've ever had tried to have a conversation with a two and a half year old or a three year old, they are not logical people. But, you know, for them, what they want makes sense, right? And so even if we can't really understand it from their perspective, it's really important for them. Um, and so it's really kind of key to think about how are we responding? How are we understanding behavior? What does that look like? So these are some ways that we can respond when our kids are kind of engaging in behaviors that are really challenging for us. You know, oftentimes the quickest way that we react is we say, no, stop, don't, right? It can be helpful to tell our kids what they can do. You can jump on this pillow. You know, you can throw this stuffed animal. Redirecting them. Toddlers are great. Young children are great at redirection, right? If you can offer them something to kind of distract their attention, you can also create a calm space. You know, when kids are really kind of overwhelmed or they're having a hard time, giving them somewhere to be that's quiet and calm. Giving the child a task to do. Let's give them, you know, oh, are you my special helper in the classroom? Do you want to help me move all these chairs? You might not actually need the chairs moved, but it gives them something to do, right? Blowing bubbles, counting to 10, you know, showing that empathy, right? We can be empathetic to a child's behavior and we don't have to join in to the chaos, right? We can say, I, I can see that you're having a hard time. That's really frustrating. We ourselves do not need to become frustrated and we don't need to join in with that yelling, right? We can support without engaging. Um, we can also validate their feelings. We can tell our kids, I can see you're really frustrated. We don't have to be frustrated. We can just observe that behavior in them. Um, and we can still set limits, right? It is still okay to tell our kids, we don't hit our sister. We're going to keep our feet on the floor, right? We can set those limits without being um, dismissive of where they're at emotionally and without um, kind of being punitive and um and and not really thinking about what's going on with their development and we can give them choices right toddlers and young children they really love choices so giving them options um for what they can do when they get upset it's also really important to think about how change happens you know when we think about change sometimes we think about like oh 
well, you know, I need to do this thing. And so automatically I'm going to do it. Right. But as you can see here, change is really a process. Um, and this is kind of, you know, thinking about when we want change to happen. And even for us as adults, if there's something that we want to change, we kind of are, you know, bringing that to our awareness. And then we're kind of thinking about, well, what do we need to kind of motivate us to make that change? You know, all right, we're determined. We're going to make that change. Right. And then we've, we've made the change. We've kind of taken the action and then we got to maintain that change. Right. And sometimes something happens and we've made that change. And then something happens and, and that change can't continue to happen. Right. And so, you know, all of this is a part of that change process. And this is true for kids too. It takes a while for behavior to change. And so when we as parents kind of expect, oh, well, I told them yesterday that, you know, they can't throw their food. We're going to probably have to tell them many, many, many more times before that's a skill that they can really own. Okay. This is also something to think about, you know, and, and be aware of as a parent, right? What are some ways that you yourself deal with stress or you yourself manage when things feel overwhelming? Because what we know is that stress can impact parenting. It can impact us in our jobs. It can impact us as we're caring for children. Um, and stress is caused by a variety of factors. So stress can be internal, kind of things that are going on. Um, it can also be external. So external stressors might be work or, you know, family conflicts. Internal factors might be things like, you know, negative self-talk, unrealistic expectations. Um, there are times when stress can be beneficial, when it's predictable, when it's time limited, when there are things about it that are within our control. Stress can be motivating. It can be, you know, helpful for us to get things done. Um, but, you know, right now, as a parent, you might be experiencing stress that maybe you've never managed before. You know, maybe you're a first time parent. Maybe um, your kids have really different temperament styles. Um, so, you know, then we also think about kind of that pandemic impact, right? So the things that maybe you did, activities you engaged with, um, with your older child, you know, you took your older child to swim class and now you have a younger child that hasn't had those same interactions. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of stressors that we're facing as parents um, and we may not have, you know, always the appropriate kind of tools or resources to manage that stress, but being aware of, okay, this is the stress that I'm experiencing. These are the things that feel really challenging for me as a parent. I need to be aware of that so that I know where do I need to go? Where do I need to reach out to get that help and support? Um, and so these are strategies, you know, for you as a parent, um, kind of keeping yourself calm, counting to 10, you know, calling a friend, having a plan, like the way that we think about those coping resources for our kids, we also want to think about, you know, how do we cope and manage as parents? When we know that there's something that's challenging or that's about to be really challenging for us, it helps when we can kind of have a plan or we can prepare so that we know this is going to be really challenging. I have a way that I feel like I can deal with it or I can manage. Um, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about grief and trauma. You know, for those of you that I might have worked with before or who know me, um, we could talk about any one of these topics for like a whole day. Um, right, or probably longer. Um, but it's really important to kind of think about, you know, the way that kids are impacted by the events that take place around them, because they may not always understand what's happening, um, but they absorb what's going on. They can, you know, sense when there's stress in a room. They can sense when something has changed or is different. Um, and for some kids, they have that experience of toxic stress. So um, toxic stress is when there are kind of these constant challenges that kids don't have the tools to be able to cope with. Um, and it can take a toll on a child's growth and development. And so as parents and caregivers, we play that really important role in helping kids to heal from those traumatic experiences. Some of you might have heard about the ACE study that was done. Um, ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. Um, and they there it's a questionnaire, it's 10 questions, and it um, looks at kind of the experiences that kids have had in childhood. Um, and what kind of the way that this study came about was that there were a lot of adults in the 80s that were um and early 90s that were um kind of coming to therapy. And the therapists were thinking, wow, you know 
all of these individuals that are kind of coming to therapy as adults are all have all experienced challenges in their childhood, right? And those challenges were not appropriately addressed. And so they're showing up as adults. And you as an adult, you know, you might be thinking about that, like, wow, there's some stuff that's happened in my own history, my own past. I haven't really dealt with it. And it's showing up, you know, in my parenting, it's showing up, you know, in my relationships. Um, and so for kids, you know, it's, it's so important for us to be able to kind of understand the way that kids might experience trauma or grief so that we can provide and put in place supports and resources that are beneficial. So these are some of the different ways that we define trauma. Um, we think about, you know, kind of that acute, like single incident trauma. We also think about trauma that might be more complex, um, multiple exposures, for example, of violence or, or challenges that have happened. Um, and then there's also systemic trauma, um, you know, poverty, racism, discrimination, some of those things that are, that are at play as well. Trauma symptoms can be very kind of wide ranging. Um, you might see some of those emotional symptoms. So kiddos that are having a challenge with um, their feelings, they might have an inappropriate, you know, emotional reaction to a, a particular situation. You've got those kiddos that are um, having those physiological responses. So the fight or flight um, response, you also have that impact on relationships. So being able to develop that attachment, build trust, maintain friendships. Um, you might see that impact on behavior as well. Um, and you might also see that impact on their cognitive skills. So what we know is that um, for kids that have experienced trauma and individuals who have experienced trauma, particularly early in life, um, the kind of if you were to take an image of their brain, their brain looks different when trauma has been, um, when significant trauma over a period of time has been a part of their life journey. And so being aware of what trauma can look like for kids and the way that kids experience trauma in different ways than adults, again, helps us to know what do those kids need? What are some of maybe the interventions that are gonna be really important for them? So these are some kind of strategies that we talk about for supporting kids. Um, you know, young children often behave differently when they're worried or scared. So it can help um, for us to, you know, be really consistent in our interactions, help kids to be able to label and identify their feelings, um, help to model for them how they can express those feelings and create predictable routines for kiddos. You know, trauma can feel very disruptive um, and that predictability for kids is really important. We also talk a lot about um, building resilience. So, you know, trauma, kind of recognizing that impact of trauma, recognizing the signs and symptoms. You know, if you're a, an early childhood or um, childcare professional, um, and even as a parent, you know, to be able to recognize, you know, I know that we've been through this as a family, or I know my child has experienced this um, situation, you know, how do we help to kind of develop those coping skills? Um, and the great thing about, um, you know, when we think about trauma, kind of the, the wonderful thing is that we know that kids can build that resilience. And we also know that um, one of the biggest indicators of how kids will manage um, kind of and, and navigate through that trauma is the presence of one consistent, responsive caregiver, right? So even just that one person that is um, kind of available for that child can make a huge difference in terms of how that child navigates through trauma. So in the next few slides, I just have some um, kind of places that you can go. We talk about um, the ASQSE is the ages and stages questionnaire for kind of social emotional development. Um, this is, again, it's online. It's a free tool. They um, provide learning and engagement ideas for um, young children and toddlers. So it gives you kind of this list of, you know, singing songs to your child and engaging them in peekaboo and games, um, how to develop some of those play skills. And they have it for um, kiddos at different ages. And then these are um, some other resources that can be really helpful. These are all free resources, um, but they're great kind of evidence-based, right? And when I say evidence-based, I know, you know, some of us um, spend some time on Dr. Google and we might um, do some self-diagnosing or diagnosing of our kiddos. Um, and so I would encourage you to stay away from Dr. Google um, because it is not always evidence-based. Anyone can put anything onto the internet. Um, and so these are resources that are um, evidence-based. They're kind of backed by science and research. Um, 
so the CDC milestones kind of talks about what you can expect with your child's development. Um, zero to three is another great resource that has lots of information about um, development and behavior and social emotional learning and skills. Um, these are some great kind of recommended readings. These top three bullets are books um, that kind of as a parent have helped me to learn a lot about the way that I parent, but also as an early childhood professional um, have helped me to kind of understand more about the parents I work with. Um, these middle um, kind of big little feelings, good inside and unruffled, those are great podcasts, cl mental health clinicians, um, who have kind of put together this information. And then these bottom two are free apps um, that talk to you about kind of what's happening with your child's development, provide ideas for activities that you can engage in with your child. So I definitely recommend kind of following up and learning more um, by going to these um, places to, to learn more information. So we are right about 1110. Um, and I, I want to be kind of respectful of everyone's time and be able to end right at 1130. But I did also want to provide an opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, and I'll do my best to answer as many of them as I can. Naomi, thank you so much. Um, this was wow. So much amazing information. And thank you again for sharing all this with us. What we invite our um, participants to do is please go ahead and put your questions in the chat box. We really would love to um, hear from you and hear uh, what questions you might have. Um, we'll give people a minute. Ah, so the first yep. one, you see that, Naomi? I best do, way the to best help, way. Yeah, to help child and parent at child care drop off. Sure. So um, the... So I will say, you know, child care professionals are pros at drop off. Um, and I think for a lot of kiddos, you know, helping to kind of prepare them. So if it's something, you know, fun that you can do in the car to kind of talk to them about, you know, what's going to happen in their day and how great of a day they're going to have, right? Kind of modeling that positivity for your child. I think, you know, really, and I, I've worked in child care center, centers, I've done, you know, summer camps with young kiddos. It's really kind of the consistent routine. Every single time you're doing the same thing. It's really important if you can kind of, I love you, have a great day, I'll see you later, right? Um, the longer that you're there, the more challenging it is because the child doesn't really know when you're gonna leave, right? And if you're there and then you leave kind of after the child has calmed down, then they escalate again. Um, so really just helping to kind of, I love you. I'll see you later. I hope you have a great day. Um, and talking to your child's teacher, you know, my child might have a harder time. Are there things that they could do when they get into the classroom? Um, if it's a really young child, you know, could they maybe spend some more time with that, that caregiver? Um, I will tell you as a parent, I have sat in the parking lot of my child's school. Uh, I have followed the bus before. Um, sometimes as a parent, it can be helpful. Like, drop off feels really challenging for me. Can I, you know, get a <laughs> cup of coffee? Can I listen to my favorite song? Can I just do some self-talk? Like it's going to be okay. Um, because it is a really challenging time of day. And, you know, typically if you've got a kiddo that's starting at a new childcare setting, whatever that setting might look like, it does take them some time. So it's probably going to take, you know, some early, um, a lot of kind of repeated, um, positive experiences for them to really be comfortable with drop off. Um, All right. So let me read you this one. Um, <clears throat> so the parents said, of course, you know, again, this was around, uh, we did base this webinar today on early childhood, mm -hmm. um, but she said she does need a little bit of help with her third grader. Any tools specifically um, that could support kids with social emotional challenges? And I know she's asking about FCPS, but Naomi, if you have any, because um, I know you don't, you are, are not um, an FCPS employee, but right. um, what might you recommend? Okay. Um, so I would definitely, um, I would definitely reach out to your child's teacher. I would definitely reach out to the social worker at your child's school um, to kind of talk about um, you know, what those challenges might look like if you haven't done that already. Um, I would also, you know, in, I know in Fairfax County, 
Um, we do have um, kind of parent, you know, supports that are available. Um, I also know that there are kind of therapy practices, uh, mental health practices that provide supports for parents. Um, you know, social skills groups might be another great way for some older kiddos to kind of get that support from peers. You know, if, if there's challenges with the peers kind of in the classroom, um, it might be helpful for them to be able to kind of have some positive social interactions with kiddos, you know, out in the community. Um, so I would definitely, you know, again, I would, I would reach out to that teacher and the social worker at school, but I would also look to see, you know, are there, um, and the, the school social worker may be a great resource to kind of connect you with, you know, some of those social skills groups. Um, there are clinicians kind of in the community that, that do provide those um, for kids. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, at that age still, you know, maybe some play therapy would be um, beneficial. So you can kind of talk to your school social worker about, you know, what that might look like in the community as well. Thanks, Naomi. And I actually would offer um, that um, in elementary schools, we do morning meeting. Um, and that is part of the so social emotional um, learning um, curriculum. And so again, I think your advice about reaching out to the teacher and having those conversations, what, what are they working on during morning meeting um, and other um, curriculum that they're using, I think would be um, really beneficial. Yeah. All right. So, I can see this, this next one. Yeah. Um, this is a great question about COVID babies. Um, I also had uh, my third kiddo was born um, right at the end of 2019. I think he was at a, his in-home daycare for, you know, two weeks and then everything shut down. Um, and my youngest was born um, also in 2021. Um, so kids have, you know, depending on, um, you know, those, those kind of younger kiddos, right? A lot of those classes and, you know, I'm in the community and, you know, how do I, um, those classes that might've been available as a parent or just some of those social opportunities, right? We're all gonna get together for some coffee um, have looked really different. And, you know, there isn't a whole, because we still are kind of in the pandemic to a certain extent, there isn't a whole lot of research um, that's come out yet because it's 2022 and, and research takes some time to kind of develop. So, um, or it's 2023 now, but, you know, um, it just takes time for that to, to kind of develop and, and for studies to be able to be done because these kids are still pretty young. Um, so yeah, I mean, kids have had a lot of, a lot less kind of social interaction. Um, but what we also know about young kids is that they develop a lot of their social skills just within their family. So even only children, right? That interaction that they have with their parents, maybe other family members. Um, and so it's, you know, classes and, and community-based activities are not a requirement for kids to develop social emotional skills. The other thing that's great about, you know, young kiddos born in the pandemic is that they have a lot of opportunities to build those skills. So maybe if there's a class now that you feel comfortable going to, they, you know, they're going to have so many opportunities to to develop those skills, you could, if you feel comfortable, you know, being in the community now, that's something that you could kind of start to build for them. The other thing is they've got a whole lot of peers, right? There's a whole lot of other kids born in pandemic times who are also facing some of those same challenges, right? And so it is tough because, you know, I think about my older kids, like, I don't know that my three-year-old has ever been to Target, right? And like, I think with my oldest, I probably drove to Target like on my way home from the hospital. Um, so there have been for sure those differences, but I think at the same time, you know, thinking about those ways that you can develop the skills now because they will have a lot of those opportunities to practice and they do have other kiddos um, that are kind of in that same boat. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So let me, can I, if I could read the questions to Naomi, yeah, just because that'd be great. people that, that are, are watching the recording. Um, so suggestions for reassuring um, an older sibling who's five, that they're not in competition with their two-year-old sibling, um, understanding that may be difficult for them now to have to share their parents. Yeah. Sharing parents is hard. <laughs> Sometimes older siblings are in competition. Um, we tell my 11-year-old that all the time. We're not competing with your five-year-old sister. Um, so it, it is really challenging. I think, you know, when you have an older kiddo, you know, when they 
kind of have gotten used to, right? This is my parents and this is kind of our interactions and the way that things go. Um, it is really hard. I think promoting a lot of those opportunities for sharing and, and game playing, right? So when you can play a game and it's not, someone's not winning, right? There's not a winner and a loser. There's just, we're, we're playing the game to play the game. If there are those opportunities for, um, you know, we're going to kick the ball back and forth, your turn, your turn, right? Spending a lot of time, you know, or as much time as you can as a parent, kind of one-on-one -on -one with each kiddo. Um, and some of it may just be also that the older kiddo, like that might be you know, their temperament style is like, they are the ones that kind of want things to be a competition. Um, so it might also be a good opportunity, you know, if you have that availability to find some activities for, for your older kiddo with their same age peers, um, that they could be, you know, kind of directing that competitiveness, um, you know, on a soccer team or in a swim class um, or in a, you know, a community-based activity um, to where they have that opportunity with kind of kids their age. And then when they're at home, um, you know, just that kind of back and forth and that playing um, and a lot of kind of directing that as a parent. All right. So next question. What, how do you recommend dealing with inappropriate language during tantrums? You know, my three-year-old says a lot of shut up, you're stupid. Um, he's my second. So he picks up a lot from hanging out with older brother and friends. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of that a lot of the reason why younger kids tend to use that language is of course, because they hear it from older kiddos. Um, but also I think, you know, they're, they're kind of testing it out. Like if I say this, is someone going to have a reaction? So I think keeping your response as neutral as possible, right? Um, you know, we don't use that word. Um, and really just kind of addressing it in that moment and kind of moving on, right? Because I think the more that you focus on it, the more he's going to want to do it because he's realized, oh, when I say this, people are reacting. Um, and I think for a lot of kids, you know, the game isn't fun if you don't play. So if you don't engage with him, um, he's probably going to realize that you're not going to have a response to those words and he's going to find some different ones to be able to use. I would for sure encourage the older sibling to not use those words as well. Um, but I also think, you know, kids are in some ways, they're kind of testing things out and they're, they're trying to kind of see, you know, what's going to be the response. Um, so I think if you can keep your response as neutral as possible, that's going to be um, a really good strategy to use. No, thank you. Um, so maybe a few strategies for holding four to five-year-olds accountable for their behavior. Um, I think this is from a, um, a child care provider, you know, screaming, I want this now. Parent has shared the child does it at home. Um, we know home discipline is different from school sure. or center what might be helpful. Yeah. And I think really, you know, giving them um, kind of some ways to be able to, you know, oh, it's really hard for me to hear you when you're screaming. Can we say that in a different way? You know, I know, I know you really want that toy right now. Bobby's playing with the toy. What can we find to play with instead? You know, and giving them those other ways that they can still express themselves, right? If that's the behavior that they've learned is I want this now. And maybe that's been the response is when they scream, they get what it is that they want. Um, so really to try and, um, you know, give them some words that they can use, give them some ways that they can express themselves and continue to model that for them. Um, give them some ways that they can ask. Can we ask Bobby if he's done with the truck? Oh, he's not done yet. Okay, what can we find to play with instead? Um, even, you know, an, a way to express that anger. I know you're so angry right now. What can we do when we're angry? Oops, looks like we lost. We can you. stomp our feet. Yeah. Are you ready to play? So really just kind of for them. Okay. Um, another another uh, parent is asking about, you know, when kids say, I don't like you, you're the worst parent, um, you know, over things that might be in the child's best interest, but of course the child may not like, um, you know, what might be some ways to kind of tackle that with our. Yeah. With our so. 
that's probably as a parent, one of the hardest things to hear, right? I don't like you. And really, I think, yeah, I hate you. You're the worst (laughs) parent ever. Um, And really, I think it's important to kind of recognize what's underlying that, right? So what Naomi, I think you're freezing up on us. Oh, goodness. They're probably saying to you, really, kids don't have that ability to kind of see things to be off a screen, right? I also don't know that any child, you know, really would say when you kind of tell them to turn off the screen that they're like, okay, that sounds great. I'd love to do that right now, right? Um, So I think, again, keeping yourself kind of as calm as possible and just recognizing what your, you know, kids express their kind of hardest emotions with the people that they feel most comfortable with which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, um, but they do. And so your child does feel comfortable enough to express those emotions. And I think you can reflect back. I know it's really hard when we have to turn off the screen or yeah, it's tough to wear our jacket outside, you know, but that's what we do when it's cold. Um, And so I think if you can keep yourself kind of as calm as possible in that moment, it provides them the opportunity to know it's okay that you're expressing those feelings. It's okay that you're saying that you don't like this decision, that's still the decision that we're making. Um, and your child, as they get older, will learn other ways of communicating that. It's just in that moment, I think because they're feeling frustrated, you know, they they kind of want to express that frustration back to you as a parent. Yeah. Um, this next question is great. And it just reminds me of when my very independent three-year-old didn't want to take a nap at daycare anymore. So the parent says the world does not support the different types of temperament and does not maybe give proper meaning to their behavior. So, you know, at daycare, her child was labeled as quiet or stubborn. Um, you know, how can we kind of prevent, um, you know, some of this, what do we say, maybe what do we say to a teacher or daycare provider um, in kind of advocating for our child's temperament? Yeah. And and I think maybe, you know, just talking to them about, you know, maybe even as a parent, right? Like, here's what I understand about, you know, our temperament at home and like, you know, um, our, the parent temperament, here's what we know about our child's temperament. Like, I'm wondering what you guys are seeing, you know, as much as you can to kind of build that com- uh, com- conversation and kind of interaction with the child's teacher, and then to kind of be collaborative in, you know, the strategies like, okay, you know, what can we do when, you know, nap time is really challenging or what can we do when, you know, he's coming into the classroom and maybe there's a lot of activity and he just needs to kind of sit and be quiet for a minute. Um, Because I think sometimes, you know, and and when you think about, you know, kids in a classroom, right, it's different when you're kind of one on one with your child at home versus like your child going to a classroom with a whole bunch of other of other kiddos. Um, And so just having that conversation and kind of thinking about what are going to be those opportunities or the options that are available in the classroom. You know, you could always have that conversation with, you know, the school principal or the center director about, you know, how can we really build those um those opportunities for him to, to kind of do well, right. That to, to promote that. Um, and then the second part of this question that says, how can we prevent secure attachment from fostering dependency? I think that that's a question that we ask, you know, that gets asked often. Kids are always trying to do the best that they can. Right. Um, my daughter who was involved in early intervention has low muscle tone. Um, and she also has kind of some medical conditions that impact her And sometimes I have to remember, like she's six and she'll be like, you know, my legs hurt. I'm like, do your legs really hurt? And I'm like, maybe that's how she's expressing to me that, you know, this is really harder for her than it might be for her brothers. Right. And so um, secure attachment does not lead to someone being dependent. Like people are driven to kind of be independent, but sometimes when kids are young, you know, it's like when you see kids that know how to walk but they kind of crawl across the floor. Crawling might be easier for them in that moment. And so I think we want to kind of appropriately challenge them, um, but not have this expectation that they're going to be able to do kind of as much as maybe we think that they can do, but that they're doing the best that they can, right? Um, And that's always kind of the the approach that I come at as a parent and also as an early child professional, 
kids are doing the best that they can with the tools and the resources that they have available for them. So um, I do have a parent who's asking about um, kind of whether a child might need private therapy or not. And, mm -hmm. and I would just let this parent know that um, it's maybe better to chat with the school, um, her pediatrician, you're welcome to give us a call here at the PRC, but I'm not sure we can kind of give advice around that since we don't work with your child and, and don't know your child, but please do reach out to one of those people who might mm -hmm. be able to help you with that. Um, and I would, I would just say like, um, in general for kids that yeah. are that young, the therapy that kind of mode that we recommend is play therapy. Um, that's something that you can kind of contact your insurance provider and ask for a list of therapists who work with children. Um, and there are kind of, you know, practices and, um, uh, agencies in the area that do provide play therapy, but I agree, Mary Beth, you know, your child's teacher, the, um, PRC, the social worker, they'd be able to more appropriately, like kind of talk with you through, you know, what's going on with your particular child and kind of what's happening. And, you know, you can always reach out to a play therapist to kind of ask for an evaluation. Um, I would also recommend kind of courses, sessions, workshops, um, you know, anything that's offered by the PRC. <laughs> Fairfax County does um, offer parenting courses. Um, there are um, you know, again, therapy practices that do groups for parents. So that might be another place to um, kind of see if you're able to get connected. Right. Um, so Naomi, as we kind of finish up, um, sure. with, um, could you maybe talk a just a little bit about um, infant and toddler connection and the services that sure. the organization provides. I think your families might like to learn. About yeah, that. absolutely. So infant toddler connection is also um, known as early intervention in Fairfax County. And it is a program that is available for children between birth and three years old who um, demonstrate a delay of 25% or more in one of their developmental areas. So they're, um, receptive or expressive language, their adaptive kind of self-help skills, their social emotional development, um, their um, cognitive skills, their fine motor skills, or their gross motor skills. And so um, assessments and kind of evaluations through infant toddler connection are free of charge. Um, if you are wondering about, you know, is my child, you know, my young child kind of meeting their milestones? Um, are they getting, you know, are they kind of doing what we would expect developmentally? You can always call and make a referral. You can call yourself as a parent. Um, you can, you know, ask your pediatrician kind of what's going on with development. Your pediatrician might refer you as well. Um, but you can always call our office, um, and, you know, we're, our referral coordinators are kind of happy to talk with you. And then um, you would kind of get that assessment done. For a lot of parents, it can be helpful to have the assessment to just kind of know, is there is there this challenge or delay or kind of is development on track? No, thank you. And I, and I would like to also add that, you know, for, for families who do get services through Infant and Toddler Connection, there's a wonderful transition opportunity mm -hmm. um, into Fairfax County Public Schools um, with regard to continued support. So, um, you know, if that's something that uh, any of you are looking at or interested in, you know, please do reach out to us at the Parent Resource Center, or certainly if you have a child that you're concerned about um, and are in that age group for infant and toddler connection, reach out to them. But just wanting to everyone to know that there are lots of opportunities for resources and support. Um, out there, and we would be happy to help answer any other questions. All right, so Naomi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for guys this, for this being morning. here. Um, and we really, really appreciate um, this opportunity to meet with you. And so we want to thank everyone. We hope everyone has a wonderful day and let us know if you need anything uh, moving forward. So hope everyone um, has a wonderful weekend. Take care.